But it's the Haskell model. What do we have here? Well, on the top, I was reusing the expression that we definitely used during the last lecture to explore the radiation pattern of a point source in the far field, taking care about polarities of P waves, for example. Compressions, dilatations, OK, good. Black, white. Let's reconvene at the focal source, at the focal sphere around the source. Let's divide it in quadrants. Let's project with a stereographic projection. And we get beach balls. OK, this is the expression that we have been using. That's for the radial component of motion, for example, that is related to P waves. We could do the same for S waves. Now, how do you recognize that this expression is related to a point source? It's not a rocket science question. Well, because here we have just M dot. <coughs> so that all the information about the moment density tensor has been integrated, and what was left was Mij with M0 there to be convolved with the spatial derivative of the Green sponge. And that's why this expression was coming out. So we have a point here where we center information. Okay, we have a receiver here, and that's R. Okay, if we have a receiver here. And then we can use a sort of a longitude and latitude. That's typically the reference system for a point source. So that R is defined. It's the distance between the receiver and the point source. That's R. It's distance. Spherical waves, P wave in this case, let's remember that we have at least also S waves. And retarded time associated to the time necessary for information to reach the receiver here, and radiation pattern due to a double couple. Green function, one force, couple, double couple. If you do remember the spatial derivative, there is also giving us a time derivative there. That piece of information is what is left for a point source. And we called it rise time. So the time necessary for that point is needed. Time is lead. Zero. Earthquake. OK, co constant. OK, this is rise time. Its time derivative is a box car. That's the end for the point source. Now, we do know that a shear dislocation is not a point. And thus, Normaskell considered a very simple extended source model. Rupture is starting at the beginning of the fold that is a rectangle with a length and a width. It's starting here, that segment has a rise time, has a distance to a receiver, just this segment here. Waves are leaving this point here. Then we have a given slip there, a given amount of slip there, a given rise time, and a given slip direction. So for a point source, that's the end of the game. But here now, we are going to consider a rupture that is propagating from here to the end of the rupture area. 
What does it mean? That, okay, after some time, this will be switched on. It will sleep with the same amount of sleep, with the same direction of sleep, with the same rise time. Everything is the same. And so on. And at each time, waves are leaving the rupture point and going to a receiver. So it's like, but it's more complicated, a sort of a Doppler effect. Because you have a sound source that is emitting, but now it's not fixed in space. It's moving. So according to your position, the frequency of the sound waves that you're going to perceive will be different. You can imagine if a source is coming to you or getting far from you. So the perception of the sound will be different. Here it is the same. <clears throat> okay. How much it will take for the rupture to start and complete? Well, everything depends on the velocity of the rupture. In the Haskell model, rupture velocity is considered constant. It's considered to be, and this is also an experimental feature for most of the earthquakes, rupture velocity is constant and it's a percentage of Vs. Let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Vs. So that the rupture from its beginning to its end is going to take L length over Vr to complete. That kinematic time will be called rupture time. What's VS? VR. Ah, VS is S wave velocity. Okay. Sorry. Beta. Yeah. Square root of mu over. Okay. What we have to do now is to compute the displacement at the receiver from this set of sub sources. Ah, you can call it, you can consider it as a sum. Or, if you're going to a discrete, if you're considering a discrete space, if you're going to consider a continuous, it's going to be an integral. Okay, what should we do here? Okay, let's take this expression here and let's sum it. Because one term will be coming from this, one from this, and so on. So it will be the sum, the displacement received at a given receiver here will be due to the sum of each of these contributions. Okay? It's linear. Everything is linear here. So what we have to do here is to take the sum of a different displacement, of a single displacement. Now, we need two times. One is the time necessary for radiation to reach the receiver, and that's Ri, if you want, over alpha or over beta. But we have also to take care about the time necessary for the rupture to reach the ith element. Okay? But that's it. Now let's consider each single factor here. What about UI? Well, UI will be something like that. With a given radiation pattern, with a given distance, and with a given time information. Now, we will move back and forth between different approximations just to simplify <coughs> parts, different parts of the algebra. What about the radiation pattern? Well, you should say, OK, look, every point actually has a different theta and phi. Let's imagine that we are so far from the source that we can consider them the same, but not so far that the source is a point. For lazy people, okay? Good. If that is true, this part is coming out from the sun. What's next? This factor here will be constant. Let's get it out. What's left there? Okay. And dot. What about M? M is mu A, but now is uh, the area of a single segment. 
to write Doble in JL. So it will be the width times this step here. Okay? And it is dx pair. So let's call it dA or delta A. What's the final term? The slip. Now, in Haskell's model, the amount of slip is constant for all the single segments. But wait a second, because now we have the derivative. OK. So that it is the slip and its time derivative. That's why now here, from delta A, we're getting a w out, mu is out. And now we have d dot, where d, if you want, I'm sorry I'm using this, but let's call it d, the amount of sleep, OK? Over the single distances, good, and the time necessary for the rupture to reach that point, dx. Now, how can we write this? Well, if you think about it, this is a set of deltas, which switch, switch, in time it's like a clock, okay? So we can imagine that this function here is this time information, d dot, convolved with a set of deltas. What is deciding the spacing of these deltas? Well, it's the time necessary for the rupture to reach this point. So according to where you are and to rupture velocity, you will get this switching interval. And this is the distance of a single segment over rupture velocity. That's the new parameter. We can rewrite this, considering instead of a sum, an integral. Now, ask the model is saying this is constant for all the pieces. Let's get it out. What we are left here is an integral between 0 and the final length here of a set of deltas that are switched on at different intervals. You should ask me, why we're writing all these things here like that? OK, please ask me. Why are you? OK, because now, after the integration, this is nothing else than a box card. And this duration is nothing else than this. <clears throat> so we reach a conclusion here. That the radiation at the point from an extended fold for this model where most of the factors are constant is what we were waiting for, but convolved for a new box car. Now, if this boxcar is a delta, we go back to, the, to this expression. But is this boxcar a delta? No. Actually, the duration of this is much longer than this. So now, we do need to consider the convolution of two boxcars. And the convolution of the two boxcars, I'm using your intuition, is a trapezoid. You will see it in the next. So let's imagine to convolve this with this. The net result will be something like that. Where this duration is tau and this duration is dr. OK, and that's it. So the first conclusion that we are getting from an extended source model, a simple one, the simplest one that you can imagine, rupture starting, propagating with constant rupture velocity. <coughs> In the time domain, if you imagine to average all the, influ the influence of radiation pattern, you know, OK, it's a strong influence because the lo you have lobes. But OK, let's take an average. Let's forget about the decay 
of one over distance. Okay, we know it, geometrical spreading, good. But in the time domain, the information that is left is this. It's the convolution of the boxcar related to the sleep and the boxcar related to the rapture time. Okay, so what? Now we have two pieces of information for kinematics, at least two. The rise time that we needed to, if you remember one of the first pictures, before the terrible lectures about representation of theorem and Green's function was a simple one. A long time ago, before the terrible times of representation theorem, we admired this nice cartoon and a simple one, where we have the actual slip field on a fault with its rupture area and we said okay let's take an average so we compute the average of the uh, arrows which are related to sleep we take just a single one we take the surface of a rupture so a in that part and what is left here actually it's only sleep you do remember then okay double count Now, if you want to take, and we have to take into account the finiteness of a fault, of a rupture of a fault, now we are getting the additional part. So not only capital D dot, the derivative of the slip, rise time, duration, now we have also a box curve related to the rupture, which is taking time. If you do remember, the animation that we have seen for Toku was giving us at least two minutes for the rapture starting, going to the north, to the south, stopping. Two minutes. So for large earthquakes, rapture time can be very long. Very long compared to rise time, but usually, okay, varies according to the magnitude, to the slip, but it's of the order of seconds. Okay? So this boxcar for large earthquakes is longer. Okay, and this is a nice picture of a real signal that if you consider it in the acceleration, it seems wiggly as usual with acceleration. Band velocity, band displacement, you see something is resembling there, a trapezoid. Okay, now we will explore two consequences of this sketch. The first one will be called directivity. Because in practice, the duration of that trapezoid will depend on the relative position of the receiver compared to the rupture. Yes? Can I, uh, okay. Um, TC on this, on this drawing is the rupture time. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. That's the price to pay in order to use but you're right, I can change it. What is the messy part? And my hope was that it was not so messy. <coughs> Let's agree on one name. Let's call this rise time, okay? In these slides here that I'm grabbing from different textbooks and some pictures from them, it has different symbols. For example, when I usually when I draw it on a blackboard, I use this. In this slide here is tau t. If I read, it's not tau c. Look, tau c there is tr plus rise time plus convolved. I mean, the what is plus? Duration. Ah, here, yes, here it is plus. So tau, if you forget the slides and you just give a look to these terrible sketches here, rise time, rapture time, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Tau 
plus TR. Usually, this is longer than this. Okay, convolution. Can you imagine the two squares that are crossing and then flat? So this is tau TR, this is tau. Now, that's tau TR. Is that fine? Tau T, tau C. In another slide, it will have a different name as well. Okay? But let's physically agree on the two things. Right step, rapture step. Is that okay? Yeah, but tau C here is a rapture step, right? Yes, that was it. Okay, maybe I'm just like confusing it. Because like according to the slide, the, the rapture time consists of the rise time. No, 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 no. It's only graphical effect. I hope it will not be recorded. How to make the convolution of this tube? Okay, this is tau, this is tr, okay? Now let's make a convolution. You have to reverse one, okay, it's symmetric. Then you have to compute the integral of the product. Zero, 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 oh, something is happening here. Now, this will come over, okay? So this, the first part will be just this length. Now this will enter and this is getting out. So, TR is containing tau, but just in convolution. It's not related. Have you ever performed convolution? Yeah. Okay. So, this is not this. This is not containing this. But you have two times and convolving them. Enter. Now, the first part of this will be this. Okay? Now it's hidden. Now this will go. Okay. Now, here, we're getting this part. And now, it's getting out. Zero. So, if I get your question, you're asking, is TR containing tau? In terms of duration, yes, but they are not related. Okay, good. That's all. TR is greater than tau. If you take a magnitude one earthquake, no. TR is the time necessary for the rapture to start, to move, to stop. Okay? If your source is a point, TR is zero. What? No, no, no. It's, it's okay. okay. Yeah. TR for large earthquakes is the time necessary for the rapture to start and to move at the end of the fault. Okay? Yes. Is that fine? Yes. Okay. I told you. VR is a percentage of VS. An average is, okay? How much is on average VS? How much is on average VS? Let's give a number. Four kilometers per second, okay? Let's take this three kilometers per second, okay? That's a rupture velocity. Are you following me? Yes. Okay. Good. Let's take a photo of one meter. How much is TR? One Nothing. Two. One? Two. One over 3,000. Yeah. Nothing. Right, then could be one second. So for very small earthquakes, TR, maybe, is more than tau. But now let's take a 600 kilometers fault rupture. 
Ama çeşit. It's not rocket science. It's two hundred. So let's take three minutes. Good. Is three minutes longer than one second? Yes. Okay. So for large earthquakes, TR is longer than tau. Is that fine? Good. Can I go? Now, we will get two consequences, at least two. The second one will be the most important for today because it will give us a vision of a source spectrum. And that will be very important for the modern definition of moment magnitude, MW, that is based wow, on this. Okay? Good. The first one is actually the origin of all this messy stuff. <coughs> because in the 50s, uh, the first paper by, by Askel about this model here was 1964. But some years before, Hugo Benioff, that is also a very famous seismologist, uh, the one that was studying the distribution of hypocenters with depth, so many of planes, uh, was studying how, in the frequency domain, seismic energy was distributed around an earthquake. So it was the beginning, the beginning of a study of what we call source spectrum. And he was looking for what he called directivity. Now, And this is very similar to what we call Doppler's effect for sound. Remember, if you are on a, on a train, you're driving a train and you're whistling your, your something, some sound, for you, the frequency of a whistle will always be 1000 Hz. Okay? But look at the people uh, at the stations, when the train will come and when we leave, that frequency will be felt differently. Higher at the beginning, lower after. But the train driver was still listening at 1000 Hz. Okay? Now, let's imagine to be different receivers around the fold. And let's imagine to be, for example, in front of the rupture, neutral to the rupture, or maybe back to the rupture. The main conclusion is that TR felt by a receiver will be different. And it's very intuitive because if the rupture is coming to you, you will see that this is radiating, this is radiating, this is going to radiate to you, but now it has less space to travel, okay? And so those waves compared to a receiver on the other side, now let's imagine the other side, now the source is moving out moving far from the receiver. So now the waves, the rupture has to go there, and the waves have to make an additional L to travel to the receiver. Okay? Well, there you have them. Okay, that is directivity. That is a sort of a Doppler effect for seismic radiation. How to demonstrate that? Well, it's actually just geometry. Let's imagine now to be so far from a source, but not that far. It's not a point. We are here somewhere at, a dis at a, making an angle theta respect to the fault plane. Okay, let's imagine to see it from the top now. And you are here. Okay? Now, let's see if I make it. L. And let's imagine to be a receiver here. Now, the first segment is going to radiate, right? Rapture is starting, waves are leaving this. Rapture is moving, 
waves are leaving this. Rupture is moving, 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 radiation, radiation, radiation. Okay, let's be final. What is the retarded time now? Well, it will be L divided by R. But now the distance here is less than this. How much? It depends by the angle. If you imagine to be here, now you have this situation, same, 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 same. Now if you think about it, you have the same L divided VR and the distance larger than the other. Everything depends on Z. Okay? So that the rupture time felt by a receiver will be L divided VR, and that's it for the source, the whistle of a train driver, plus a term that depends on the position. Well, how much? <coughs> it will depend by Z. Because at the end here, this one will depend on Z. So that here, what you have to do is to consider a distance, that is this, okay, R, 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 and it's changing, and this is getting smaller, the other one is getting larger, according to Z. So C here is a velocity, it could be P wave velocity, it could be S wave velocity, it's the velocity of the seismic waves, okay? So you have to take out your perception, and this is R divided by C, and you take it out and use this. Now, if you rearrange this part here and you break it, you get this expression. And you will see that when theta is zero, so you are here now, OK? So the first waves will need to make this. Then they're making to make this. Then this, OK? Let's imagine to be on the other side, I cannot draw it here. This, this. Now you're getting far from it. And you will need it to make a longer time, if you want. So that the end of the story is that the rupture time felt by the receiver is the source one. But actually, if z is 0 here, the cosine is good. And here you have minus. So according to this ratio here, your rupture time felt by you will be shorter. Now let's take theta as on the other side. It will be minus 1. So this will be plus. And actually, you will need to wait for the whole rupture to arrive and plus the information to get to you. It's like Doppler's. It's due to the relative position of a receiver respect to a moving source. What is the net result? That here, you're going to feel a rupture time that will be shorter than your friend, than the one felt by your friend on the other side. How much? It depends on this ratio here. Now, if rupture, rupture time is shorter, for you, and for your friend is longer. What's going to change there? In the terrible convolution that I was making. Because now, one of the chalks, mm -hmm. the length of one of the chalks, will depend on your position. It will be shorter or longer. Like, um, okay, for, for some. This means that this TR can be shorter and longer. So the duration of the signal will be shorter or longer. <coughs> and this will have, this has an effect. Because if you give a look to this cartoon here, and if you're staying in front of the rapture, the waves will arrive in phase. Because, OK, they're going to start later, but they have a shorter path to make. So they're going to be packed in time. 
On this side here, well, starting, but then we have to move, we have to move, and your train is leaving you, so you're getting the same energy, but arriving scattered in time in some, some fashion. What about the two sides? Well, they will be a sort of an average, because you can imagine here, okay, they're going to be mixed. So one of the conclusions <coughs> of the efforts of the final fault is, okay, yes, now we have two kinematic times, tau and tr. Their convolution is a trapezoid, but one of these times here will be felt, will, be, will last differently according to your position. You can demonstrate that the area under the trapezoids average for radiation pattern and distance is always proportional to M0. Now, I want to anticipate one thing, because otherwise... Let's see where I put it. Usually I do not show this slide now, but maybe it's here. Maybe. So, okay. Look at just at this. This is one here we're in Landers, we're in California, 1992. A famous earthquake was recorded at the time because there was a network just there, deployed there. And for the first time, one of the first times, there was a network around the fault and near to the fault. So that they are being able to trace back the rupture, and it was starting from there and moving to the north. Now let's give a look to these two signals. This is called the Lucerne Valley, and the other one is Joshua Tree Recorder. And they are about, on average, 20, 30 kilometers from what we can call an epicenter, but actually it's an extended fault. But look at them. They are totally different. So you see that Joshua tree is very long and smaller amplitude, while the other one is short in time with, this, with an important wave arriving there because the, it's in phase. And so you can call it directivity, thanks to Pascal, to Benio, for whatever. But this has also, nowadays, a strong impact on seismic hazard, because now let's imagine to have buildings spread around the fault, and the same building, if you provide it a different input, like this one, can feel a totally different vibration. Because in one case you're giving a big kick, but short in time. In the other case you're going to make a smaller kick, but it's going to, to last a long. Now, if you are a reinforced concrete building, or some steel building, no, or if you are a masonry building, I do not know which one is worst. So, the time series in the near source condition can be very different. So, for some buildings, this could be terrible, for others, no, and vice versa. So directivity is very important to study near source effects, but it's also important because, for example, it's included into the codes. Uh, they started to include it in the US codes, for example, since, let's say, at least 15 years. Codes? Seismic codes. Um, every country, hopefully, has a, oh yeah, sorry, uh, you know, I'm a seismologist, I call it seismic code. But, yeah, it's a building code. So it's a code, the laws that engineers should follow oh. to design buildings. Okay. For example, in, in Italian it's NTC, that is technical, technical building code. Or European code? No, you see that's European code. So the laws that an engineer should attend. OK? 
okay? For proper design. Okay, yeah, thank you. By the way, so you see now here an example of the effects of what we can call direct. And that's one thing. It's important, very important. I added here a slide that is for sort of a research, because it's an open question. Well, not that open, but how much is VR? Because VR is a very important parameter, because we have seen that the ratio between <coughs> wave velocity and VR will affect the rupture time as felt by a receiver. Well, I put here a link to a web page. I hope it's still working. We don't know. That is where you can find some information, additional information. To me, what is important is that you remember that the rupture velocity is usually a percentage between 70 and 90 percent of Vs, of beta. Okay? But you may have some earthquakes that have been empirically recorded and demonstrated where you can have what we call super shear rupture velocity. Super shear means, okay, higher, larger than beta. They are just a few, and usually they are strike slip. And for a strike slip earthquake, you may have a theoretical explanation of something that could have a rupture velocity larger than Vs. Here Cs is beta, Cp is alpha, or okay, Vp, and so on. So in principle, you have green light to go over CS. It's out. So sometimes it happens. But on average, please do remember that VR is 80% of PS. OK, another vision that is, not to say, could be easy to remember is that now the radiation patterns related to the point source that I've shown to you, if you remember, okay, the, the lobes, now, from the point of view of a the receiver, they can be larger or smaller according to your position with respect to the rupture. So the symmetry, the beautiful symmetry of the lobes of radiation for PNS waves can be broken by the spatial extent of the source that formed according to your position. To your position and by the ratio between rupture velocity and wave velocity. And, okay, um, I was usually putting this to show to you the impact that this um, could have also on seismic input because you're going to see now an animation of a computation of a ground motion associated to a shear dislocation on the same fault, in the same 3D model, everything is the same, except that the two ruptures, one is starting from here, and the other one is starting from here. You will see that the patches left on the ground, as yes, hot spots for, for ground motion, will be very different. So everything is the same but two ruptures. And the patches here, if I remember correctly, yeah, it's peak velocity of the motion. So it's just a message. Remember that this directivity can have an impact on seismic aspect. First message to take home about what we call ground motion scenarios. Okay. Final two slides may be the most important ones for this set, because now we're going to take a conclusion about the source spectrum. Okay, what we learned so far. The displacement field around an extended fault, a shear dislocation in, let's say, a homogeneous medium, in time is related to moment and the convolution of two box cars one of duration tau, one of duration tr. Since I was writing this, okay, this is my convention, tau tr, okay? Now, let's give a look to the frequency. 
you know that convolution in time domain becomes a beautiful product, normal algebraic product in the frequency domain. So that convolution of two box cars, one and the other one that I was repeating here, how can we depict it in the frequency domain? Now a question, uh, but the solution is written there. What is the Fourier transform of a box car? I think you... That one. You invited them to dinner, but a long time ago. No. Well, okay. Um, are you opposing other courses? Uh, some numerical methods? Have you been doing something like that? Um, well, the Fourier transform of a boxcar is the function called. Sine. Yes. Uh, in my spaghetti uh, English, I call it sync. It is sine x over x. Do, you should do remember something. Okay. Yeah, but it was just a... Very well. You have never considered a sync function? It's, it's a question. Have you ever seen a sync function? I, I guess so. But I will treat it in a very rude way. By the way, maybe I have an annotation here. I was assuming that one. Let's see if I have the annotation here. Yes. I don't remember what I was putting here. Maybe, 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 maybe. Okay. Wait a second. Now, the sync function is actually a simple function, but a beautiful one. You see here the definition. Uh, you have two ways to define it. Really, I was assuming that you know it. The typical definition not to normalize is this. And I think, and you are much younger than me, so you should remember the limit of this function going to zero. And it is. Set of x over x. It's one. One. Yeah. One. Do you remember wave physics? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the terrible sketch that I was producing for phonons? Brilu one zone. Oh yeah. Yes. And if you do remember, I was doing something terrible there because there was. Sign here. And I told you, oh, the sine function, if x is small enough, can be approximated with the first term of its series, and it is x. You remember? And we discovered acoustics inside phonons. By the way, if you do this, Terrible approximation here, but many physicists are doing when they are lazy every time. <coughs> you will get the sine of x over x. One. For small x is 1. And that's... <coughs> then it's going to be 0 every time that x is pi. That's why there is a normalized version of it. And it's called this. So that it's 0 in... One, two, three, four, five. What is the main feature of a sync function that essentially all the amplitudes are in the first lobe? Because if you imagine the integrals later, you see minus plus, minus plus, it's nothing there. And that's why. The sync function, in many cases, is terribly approximated by this, in a very rude way. 
Now, you should ask me, so what? Now, let's go back to, and that's why this animation was showing to you that actually the width of this function changes, of course, according to k. Now, you can demonstrate, but it's not my course, that the Fourier transform of a box car function of a duration, of a general duration, let's call it t, will have <coughs> the first zeros here according to 1 over t. What does it mean? But if t is very long, if t is very long, if the duration of the box head is very long, t is OK. So it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. Right? How thin? Oh, 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 oh. It will become a delta. Actually, the Fourier transform of a flat function is a delta. Let's take the opposite. If the duration of a box curve is very small, t will become very large. And actually, it will tend to be flat. And the Fourier transform of a delta will be a flat. OK. That's me. So what? Now, if we take the information in the time domain and we look at it from the Fourier transform domain, the convolution of two box, box cars becomes the algebraic product of the Fourier transform of two box cars. Good. And we arrive here. OK? We're just going moving from the time domain to the frequency domain. Convolution becomes dot. You know, it's the convolution. So what? How can I draw this simple convolution here? Well, let's give a look to, to the sync function that we have here. One is related to tau, and here we have omega, that is 2 pi, so this is pi tau, okay? And this is related to this. So it's related to L and VR. So we have two different durations. One is tau, the other one is TR. As I told you, for large and more interesting earthquakes for us, TR is longer. Okay? So the duration of this segment here is longer than this. So that this zero here will be 1 over TR. So that sync function will be, how to say, more stretched. And then we have another sync function related to tau. Tau is shorter, so the frequency domain that will be larger. So now we have two behaviors, three behaviors, according to the period that we are looking for. Let's imagine in the frequency domain before moving that we are looking at periods so long, okay, periods so long, that we are going to at zero frequency, okay, long periods. Hmm. Long periods, that means that we are at frequency so small that this is 1 and this is 1. So what we are left is this. And that will be valid for all the frequencies that are less something as 1 over TR, because TR is the longest. Then we will have a, a different regime from 
1 over tr and 1 over tau. And then we will have a different regime, because we will pair, when we are at frequencies larger than 1 over tau. And this is the conclusion. But wait a second. There is a helper here. Now, just for you to relax, this is a picture coming from Steinway Session textbook, <coughs> where the approximation that is used for the sync functions is very root. And you see on the top left, top right, sorry. Let's give a look to it. It's related to the first lobe of the function sine of x over x. Okay? The first lobe is the most important one. Please give a look. This is not normalized, so this is pi. Okay, let's be lobe. And we are saying, okay, look, you know what? Let's approximate it like that. So it's 1 and then 1 over x. Yeah, I know. You're a mathematician, please don't. <laughs> Don't get angry with us, okay? But this is one of, uh, one of the possible approximations of the sync function in this domain here. Why we adopt it? Because it's very useful. Because you can say, okay, for from this point before, let's take it 1. And from this point on, let's take it as 1 over the variable. Now we have two of these. You have to imagine that we have two lobes like that. One will be proportional 1 over tr, and this will be proportional 1 over tau. Because on average, tau is shorter than tr, so this is longer, higher frequency. And we will make this cut in different fashions. And this will go as 1 over omega, and this will go as 1 over omega. So from this point on, it will be omega square. In the intermediate frequency domain, it will be 1 over omega, and the first one, it will be 1. Summary of this mess. We have a regime. Same figure. Okay, wait, wait a second. There is a, an important step in this plot here. That's the logarithm. So that the logarithm of something as 1 over omega and 1 over omega square will become two linear, two lines, with negative slope. One will fall as 1 over the other one will fall with minus 2. So minus 1, minus 2. So please notice logarithm here. So that this domain will become a negative slope and this a more negative slope. Where? Well, it depends on these two factors. Now to make you more confused, this is TR, in my definition, and TD is tau. This is the convention adopted by Steinway Session. The previous one was the convention adopted by Lay and Wallace. This is the convention adopted by, by the poor father. But it's the same, okay? <coughs> this is one of the most important slides of this course. Because on the left, you see the expression M0 for frequencies less than something as 1 over tr. 1 over omega for the frequencies between 2 over tr and 2 over rise time, and then omega square. This is called the omega square model for the source. It has been first been released by Jim Broom at the end of the 60s. And still one of the most adopted in theoretical and empirical seismology. Now, why is it important? 
because it's telling us that the source spectrum is not flat. You know what? Okay, let's imagine it would be nice. No, it would be not. But let's imagine that the lines related to the source spectrum are just flat lines. Okay, we have just to multiply by different than zero, and the game is over. So, small earthquake, larger, 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 okay? Just flat lines. We just need to multiply in the frequency domain by M0, and we're done. Well, that's not the case. Because the source spectrum is saying that, OK, look, since the slip is taking a, an amount of time to do it, and rupture is taking an amount of time to be completed, the source spectrum is falling with frequency. And after a given frequency, it's falling as omega squared. In other terms, it's called a filter. And it's a low-pass filter. And this will have a strong influence on the definition of magnitude. Because this picture here is at the base of what we call magnitude saturation. That hopefully we're going to discover on because you have to just a prequel <coughs> the two instrumental magnitudes that were adopted in the 70s are called MB and MS this is based on body waves this is based on surface waves this is on signals recorded at 1 second this is for signals recorded at 20 seconds and in the 70s they realized that using MB, we couldn't get something larger than 6 point something, let's say 6.5, no increase. 6.5 was the largest MB value that one could reach. And for this one, it was 8.1. They said, is it possible? Is it evident that, for example, the Chilean earthquake of 1960, it was releasing much more energy than other ones. Couldn't be 8.1, It was like reaching the floor, reaching the ceiling. It's called magnitude saturation. And the fact is that it is related to that top there. Because actually, the only way to avoid saturation is to measure here. Because this point here is proportional to M0, M0, M0. That is increasing. What does it mean? Well, we have to go to zero frequency, towards zero frequency. Very long period motion. So you could say, how much long? How much long? Well, more than 20. Let's use it. Let's use 100, 200. Is that enough? No. If you use 200 seconds, as it is routine seismology, and if you record the waves from the 26, December 26, 24 in Sumatra, the number that you were getting was 8.8. And it was not. <coughs> it was 9.2. 200 seconds was not enough for a very large earthquake. Why? Because this one was so long, it was 300 seconds, but this frequency here, that is cooperating to go to the corner frequency, was getting here, here, here. 200 seconds was not enough. Question to you, oh my goodness. Do you know something that is longer some motion that is longer than 20, uh, 200 seconds? Definitely, you two should know. Sorry, 
Oh. What are surface waves that are propagating waves doing if the guitar player is strong enough? They can meet, propagate, interfere, and the last lecture of wave physics was about was about the modes of the Earth. So if you consider S02 as a free mode of the Earth, do you remember? I do. You don't. Okay. The free modes of the Earth, the longer ones, have a natural period of 54 minutes. One hour. It's very long. And that was the piece of data that Ockel, Emil, and Stein, Seth, used to reevaluate the magnitude of the Sumatra earthquake. And they released a paper a few months later saying, no, no, it was 9.2. Can you imagine something longer? No, you should know. If you stay near to the fold and near in the field, you have a near field. And the near field is leaving to you a permanent displacement, right? What is the period of a permanent displacement? It's infinite. So when you have permanent dislocations that can be recorded around the fold, then you can measure zero frequency. But in Sumatra at the time, it was not easy to have GPS. It was not easy at all. But if you have, then you'll be able to measure M0 and MW. <coughs> By the way, let's take a summary. Let's make a summary until this point here. We consider the Askel model. It's the first and simplest model with the duration of the rupture. It's simple because everything is constant. Rapture velocity, slip. Uh, it's a continue going back and forth between near source, far source, let's stay far but not so far. We discover TR, rapture time. It could be very long. Okay. And the piece of information that is traveling around a rapture is another boxcar of duration TR. Then we have another one with duration rise time. Convolution, trapezoid, directivity. So the duration at different receivers for that trapezoid is different. It's not a source property, it's a source receiver property. Okay? <coughs> then we move to the frequency domain, and the convolution becomes a property. A product of what? Well, okay, with the Fourier transform of a boxcar. Sync function. Whose first law that is the most important will occur at 1 over duration 2. Actually, there is 2, because there is a 2 pi. But it's at 1 over the duration of a boxcar. If a boxcar is very long, so long that it is infinite, it will be a delta, the sync function. And if this is going to 0, the same function will be flat. So it's like no effect. But in our case, we have a product of two sinks that can be approximated like in a terrible way, but useful, so that the source spectrum in the frequency domain averaged by radiation pattern and distance is like that where we have a flat zone proportional to M0, then a falling, then another falling with frequency. Omega square model. In the practice, since it's not easy to find this beautiful picture, what you do is to use one corner frequency. So a place where the frequency is falling. 
the end of the story should be as the square of the frequency. And so we are going to use this, this sketch here for the Magdalene feature. Question. What about this? Is it fixed? Oh, well, for the source it is. But for, its, for a receiver it is not. Because at, at, okay. this is for the source. But for the receiver it depends on where you are. So if you are in front of a rupture, TR is shorter, right? If you are backward of a rupture, your TR is longer, right? And this means that, no, this point here is moving if you are in a condition to feel that activity. So if TR is longer, this will become shorter. Is shorter, the point will move forward. Okay? By the way, the message to take home is something like that. So it's not a flat line. The source spectrum has, is behaving like a filter. So larger earthquakes will have larger M0, but in proportion, they will have less high frequencies. In proportion. Okay. Now, to show you why this is important, let me, in these 15 minutes, let me show to you a slide that we should look at on Friday. By the way, spoiler, let's end up. No, no, on Friday. Because on Wednesday, we should make one day. This is the most important part of this course. This. What you see here is flat, one over, one over. Okay? And you see here logarithm. Logarithm, and you see different numbers. This is magnitude that we are going to define. So you see, larger the earthquake is, yes, this point is getting larger and larger. It's a moment, remember. Okay? Oh. But you see that in proportion, the high frequency radiation here is getting less and less. So they are not flat lines. Okay? Let's imagine they are flat lines that you will be able to record moment at every frequency, goes at 100 hertz, for example, okay, whatever, but it is not. That's why we will need to remember what we, disc we, what we have just discussed for this plot here. Correctly, you are saying, but the next is Wednesday, but there is a problem. Maybe it will be a nice problem. But it's okay, that's the definition of magnitude. Oh, actually, we, we could start on web from this. <coughs> because the next step is to discover magnitude. Okay, and if you give a look to the original plot of Charles Richter, that was pressed by, by the media to say, okay, Look, he was in California, okay? The observatory actually was a nuclear physicist and um, uh, how to say, uh, uh, an astronomer by, 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 as a hobby, and but he was working at the, I wonder what you know, what is, I don't remember, it was, okay, in a lab with seismic instruments, and he was a sort of a, of a chief, and after Beno Gutenberg, so people was asking, what about this earth? Is it strong or not? And of course, you could have some vibration coming from a distant earthquake, but larger, or from a local earthquake in California, but was smaller. 
So you had to decide and to, to answer to the media, no, well, don't worry, this is coming from, okay. So he invented magnitude. And the definition of magnitude is, let's read this corner, okay, there you go. The logarithm of the amplitude of the motion that you record normalized to a standard earthquake. The standard earthquake was the earthquake that was given one micrometer at 100 kilometers from an instrument, his instrument. And he was using a Wood Anderson seismometer. 1930s, so there were not broadband modern instruments or smartphones with, with accelerometers, okay? So he was using it. What was available there? The California network was very important, was beautiful, uh, okay? But they were using a Wood Anderson instrument. <coughs> By the way, that's the definition. It's simple. You need to know it. The only trick is, okay, let's take the amplitude recorded on my instrument, Wood Anderson, and you compare to a zero. Now, you do remember logarithmic properties. Can we have negative magnitude? Yes. If A is less than A zero, it will be negative. But he was so smart that he was defining A0 as the threshold of noise for his instruments. So actually, that's why it was magnitude 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. So you can see it's using a reference value. It's using logarithms. So you can squeeze orders of magnitude. Do you remember decibel? You remember the decibels are very useful because you are squeezing orders of magnitude because powers are getting <coughs> before as uh, scalars that are multiplying something. Okay, good. And this was the original plot that Richter was using. Actually, the original one was this. So he was trying to make a plot of amplitude and distance for different earthquakes. And he was recognizing that according to the earthquake, they were following different paths. So he was thinking different, okay, magnitudes. So that's the starting of magnitude. That's easy. We can start from that. But it would be maybe interesting to give a look to this. That's a good Anderson. And you could say, so what? Good. <coughs> uh, it's beautiful. I think I, I think I told you yes, this one. Okay. That's a good Anderson. Okay? I move it with the ground, it's a recording emotion. Can you use it? Can you use me with this as a seismometer? Is it useful? Yes. Mm. Mm. Maybe yes for some frequencies. Now, if you want to measure something like 10 seconds or 100 of seconds, mm. because the period of an inertial system depends, for example, on the length of a pendulum. But you could say, no, 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 no. wait a second. We don't like Fabio with, with this. Uh, you know what? To measure 100 seconds, you need 100 meters. Okay, but you can go to Borgo Grotta and you have it. But you cannot move Borgo Grotta everywhere in the world, right? In California. So that's not enough. But you could say, wait a second, maybe we can use spring and mass. Right? So that, <coughs> that formula for spring and mass becomes. 
Mm-hmm. Square root square root What? <laughs> no, no, wait. The two quantities are there. It's k over m. Yeah. So m over k. <laughs> what? So m over k. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, to measure 100 seconds, what could we do? <clears throat> we should take large masses as small k. Try it. Can you imagine a small k that means a very flexible spring and one ton? You're going to break it immediately. So it was a problem. This is the problem of inertial instruments. But they were the best. But to manufacture them, you need to solve a lot of tricks. And, but they did it. They were so brave and so smart in mechanical things. That's why the first part of the next lecture is Okay, you have it at OGS. I think it's. Uh, you have to notice it because it's. Yeah, I think it's in the entrance. Yes. Um, so there are many mechanical tricks to solve that problem, but still you have one. That in any case, the response of an inertial instrument will be connected to its resonance so that. For very high frequencies, mm, it's not easy to measure that. For very low frequencies, mm, mm, but it's very easy to measure the resonance ones, so near to its period. What I'm trying to say is that the response of an inertial instrument is picked. It's good for some periods, but it's not for others. And at that time, Richter and all the others were perfectly knowing this. So he had a beautiful set of instruments, a beautiful network, everything was beautiful, <coughs> but he was aware that in any case you get a response to the specific frequency. Uh, just as a, so that the next lecture, we, we can run a little bit, let me show to you. Okay. These are what are called the response curves. They are not flat. You see the periods here? So for very long periods, for very short periods, because they are inertial, and so that the arrangement of the seismic networks was not easy. And Richter was aware of this, so that's why at the end of the story he called it magnitude, also using the hints from Gutenberg, but he agreed to call it, in the near future, local magnitude. That was not the answer, the final answer. That's why in the 70s, they decided to use MBMS. Because new instruments were, were there, longer periods, shorter periods, a lot of instruments due to Cold War in, on both sides. And that was the explosion of uh, no, the, the explosion, the, the boom of uh, seismology, instrumental one. But then there was saturation. In any case, magnitudes were not getting larger than. Approximately this one. So. After a given magnitude, MB was saturated. We need to get larger. At 8, you know now, 
because, well, actually, you don't know one thing, but as I told you, MB was measured at one second. Okay. One second in this plot here is zero. That's below the of the frequency. Now, if you go here, sooner or later, the omega square will give you no more energy there. You see? So after this point here, you cannot get more energy at that frequency. It's the roof. End of the story. MS is using 20 seconds. So you're saying, oh, nice, I can go to longer periods, shorter frequencies. But there you go. And you touch the floor, the, 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 the floor again. The roof is there. Can I go higher? Yes. Let's move to longer periods. And in principle, you can go here. 200 seconds. Well, magnitude 9 is touching the ceiling. You cannot go over with surface waves. So that the best way to measure magnitude is to go to infinite period or zero frequency. So the modes of the Earth, but you need to, you need them to be excited. So you cannot give it in one minute. You remember how long it takes for the waves to go on the other side of the Earth? 54 minutes. How much? No, 54 is this. Okay. <laughs> no, 90 minutes. 90 minutes. <clears throat> so you need at least three hours before the waves are touching again themselves. So you need some time for the free mode of the Earth to be excited and to be there. So that's why the best solution is to use would be great, but the best solution is to use near field. But if you don't have GPS around the fault, you cannot get it. Another way would be to use a very long period signal that is tsunami. Because tsunami is a very long period. And maybe we will discuss it. But it's not easy. So that's that's not an easy problem. Everything is related to the fact that there's a source spectrum. Okay, let me finish here. Is like that. So everything is related to one over omega, one over omega square. essentially connected to the duration of the rupture and to the duration of the slip. Remember that this one is depends on the subject. Okay? That's just this sort of quantum mechanics. Okay, jokes apart. Remember directivity is playing here, price tag, M0. And actually this plot here my goodness. No. <laughs> no. Don't be saying no. Actually, I saw you press it. I saw you press it. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. No, 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 I don't want to. Okay, we will. <laughs> it's like in the movies, okay? Who's the. <laughs> We will ask the director and we will play it again. Okay. Let's hope that the automatic. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Otherwise, we will make it again, like in a chunk. Okay? By the way, um, so rupture time, rise time, look here, logarithm of the amplitude. Logarithm of the amplitude is at the base of the definition of magnitude. That's why this is important. Because logarithm is making these lines, and logarithm of this is connected with the practical definition of magnitude as given by Richter. So in all magnitude definition, logarithm is there. Why? Well, for many reasons, but the first one is that so that you can squeeze a huge order uh, scale of, of energies there. From small ones to large ones, so powers will be numbers coming down, OK? So this is the most important message to take home from today's not a recording <laughs> lecture, if not.
I will make it again. So I could also press now, but okay. we will see. I don't know what to do. I think it's better not to touch it. Otherwise, I can record and then switch it off. But I don't know. I don't know. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, guys, I'm an old man. You should, you, the young, should tell me, okay, please. He asked me what I thought you had pressed it. But the end of the story, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. My fault. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Sorry about that. Let's hope that the, the guy is good enough. Question for you. In no other courses are you treating, you should be treating for a transform somewhere, right? No? Fourier transform. No? Numerical methods, yeah, something like, uh, I don't know. I don't know, just long the question distribution, distribution But before you transport. Just what we discussed. Oh. And uh, actually I don't need my No, no, okay, because usually it's very good on course. Okay. That's the matter for you. Si, si, I have a trial, it's just, it's a very nice one. Quindi vista da un matematico, che è un po' diverso. Sì, c'è questo un po' per il tirocinio, mi trovi che se voi trovi che se lei lo mi trovate il tirocinio. Ecco, Sigma Spiori, è non un corso? Sigma Spiori, sempre bene. Però la trasformata di Fourier è un segnale un po' diverso da quello. No, 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 certo. What about you? I think you studied Fourier transforming some other courses. Ok, you mean in the past? You're too young to say, oh, long time ago. No, I, I can say. I have studied Fourier transform before. Hmm. In mathematical Uni, um, graduate. Mm -hmm. But in the exam of geophysics, you can use I mean, you studied Fourier transform in some other courses, right? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's like we had the signal processing. Okay, 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 okay. So it's there. Yeah. So, okay. So convolution theorem is there. Yeah, okay, I, I, I wouldn't participate in the signal processing course, but I will say I, have, I had the notes and stuff, so it's, uh, it's not a new thing. <laughs> Convolution theorem? No. For me, I studied in my master's. What? Convolution theorem? No. Ah, it's in the next lecture, uh, but I was putting it just as a, okay? It's, it's better. It's not there for me. Well, it's very simple. In time domain, convolution of x convolved with y becomes the product of the two Fourier transforms and vice versa. So you don't know. Okay, we'll try to take care of more of it. Um, well, it's exciting.